Yep. Yep. Go ahead, yes. Joel. Looks great. All right. Perfect. Okay. So, like Virginia said, my name is Joel Calipo. Uh, I was part of. Hey, Joel. Can you try uh, to turn up your speaker a little bit more? Sure. Is that better? That's great, Joel. Yeah, take it away. All right, perfect. So like I said, uh, my name is Joel Cal. Currently a colorectal surgery fellow down at Lehigh Valley Hospital. If you guys are, if anybody's from the Pennsylvania area, then you know that area pretty well. So uh, what I'm going to go over is pretty much high yield colorectal surgery um, for the, you know, for the app site. Um, general for the app site, it's, you know, and for most, uh, for most parts of the app site, you guys have to realize it's the general principles of surgery that they want you to learn. And they're not going to test you on the most advanced things and things like that, because the app site just doesn't get updated that often. Um, so we're going to do 30 to 40 minutes of material review. Uh, I like to be very interactive, you know, so if I, you know, I will have questions intermixed with the, with the review. So just, you know, shout out the answer that we can, uh, you know, start conversation and the rest of the time, uh, we'll finish off with some, a uh, bunch of questions. And I've manipulated them a little bit just to make them all the more fun. All right. So just my 2 cents that I give everybody about the app site. Good night sleep. Don't try to stay up till midnight to review things. Get a good night's sleep. Have a great breakfast. Okay. If you're a breakfast person, have a scramble with like three eggs and vegetables and you know the works. Bring snacks. It's a hard test. It's a long test. You need the energy. Okay. Most important, take the fear out of the test. I know everyone's scared. Okay, it's just knowing the principles and practice. Okay. Because everybody walks into the test thinking it looks like this. Okay. It's not, it's just a test. Okay. All right. So basics. Okay. So colorectal surgery, you got to know the anatomy. The anatomy is very straightforward. And if you remember it, I, I make every single med student intern that I ever have draw out of a, a whole colon with the anatomy. Uh, arterial venous that way everything is able to you can focus on exactly what needs to be done for resection and understand why this part of the colon is being resected for a tumor or a bleed or anything like that so you can see down for the anatomy it starts off when you start off with your iliorectal um, artery your right colonic artery and your mid colic uh, just you know for some anatomy variants not everybody has a right colic artery People just have colic. Then you go down to your inferior uh, mesenteric artery, which gives off your left colic, your IMAs, and your sigmoid arteries. Then the venous drainage to, uh, to the arterial. It runs alongside with it. You just have to know that it all comes to the uh, inferior uh, mesenteric vein, the superior mesenteric vein, which will join up at the neck of the pancreas to become the portal vein, which leads up to the liver. Okay, down to the rectum. Okay, rectum has its own arterial supply as well that you have to pay attention to. Has a superior rectal artery, which comes also. On each side, give way to the middle rectal arteries, and your inferior rectal arteries will come for your internal pudendals. Okay, those are important, and you could tell just by the picture the rectum is very, very well vascularized. It is very difficult to get, um, you know, a necrotic or ischemic rectum. Um, there. Area, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, but in terms, it's very almost near impossible to like have it like emergent APR for a dead rectum, and you can tell why. Venous drainage is very similar. Okay, you have your middle rectal veins, your inferior rectal veins, and give way to your hemorrhoids. So just some functions of the colon that are high yield. The colon secretes potassium and reabsorbs sodium and water, hence why the pure function of the colon is to secrete Juices and intestinal fluid from the small intestines into hardened stool. Uh, mainly, the, mo the area that secretes the, that secretes the most potassium um, is the ascending colon, which is a common question I've gotten in the past. Um, all all the structures of 
with your shoulder is pretty much flopping in the breeze there, hanging underneath your momentum. All right. Nerve complexes. I've seen a question of this before. You have Meisner's in, uh, uh, and the back complex, which is the outer portion. Colonocytes main food source is short chain fatty acids. That is a question almost every year. Take it to the bank. You got it. Polyps. Okay. So this is where questions get confusing and they will try to confuse you, but I'm going to break it down very easily. Okay. The most common polyp is a. Tubular adenoma is the most common. A tubular adenoma is the most common neoplastic polyp, meaning they have malignant potential. Okay, but by far and away, a hyperplastic polyp is the most common. There's no risk of cancer for a hyperplastic polyp. Tubular adenomas are a different story. Okay, these are what mainly rise and turn into cancer. They use the tubular ones are usually pedunculated, hence the word tubular. So they kind of look like a mushroom with a big stalk. Broad base. So they're a little bit more towards the mucosa. And those are very suspicious. And the bigger they get, they can definitely hide a cancer, especially if they're over two centimeters. Okay. Most polyps can be removed endoscopically, but if they can't, then that's when we talk about requiring a resection. Here's a polyp, you see it's right down to the mucosa, and here's a pedunculated polyp kind of upside down, but you see this polyp right here sticking out with a nice stalk right here. So, invasive, if it invades the submucosa, that is key. Sometimes they'll give you a path report uh, on the outside and say, oh, it is uh, mucosal adenocarcinoma and the resection margins were clear. Now, what do you do? Well, it's adenocarcinoma. So some people will think right to resection. No, it's mucosal. So it's it's staying in the mucosa other than typical follow-up, okay? So by terms of intramucosal, it means it's gone and it not gone through the basement membrane of the mucosa. Is intact, but the cells appear abnormal. And it, the reason why they call it high grade, if you imagine your colonocytes, they start down in the crypts and they develop, they develop, they develop all the way get they get to the top layer. So high grade dysplasia means you have dysplasia throughout that whole column. Whereas low grade, you have it in the bottom, medium is uh, is, is middle, but all through all three layers is high grade. All right. Colonoscopy. This is common. Okay. So colonoscopy with with no inherited or increased risk to the general population is every 10 years starting at the age of 50. That is changing. For you guys, it's 50, but for uh, if you go out and practice now, um, the American Association of Colorectal Surgeons, GI's Association as well, has said it's going to be They declare and agree with it, then the insurances will start paying for it, which is obviously the big one, but now it's 45. All right. Um, if you have now for cancer, if you have a cancer history, then you start getting scoped at the age of 40 or 10. So if you had a older brother who was diagnosed at 42 years old with colon cancer, you're getting a scope at 32. Okay. So it's whichever is earliest. All right. They will, I've never seen the app site mention anything about a, um, a cologuard or some type of fecal occult test uh, or anything like that. It is in the guidelines that you can replace a colonoscopy with one of those studies every three years uh, and a flexig every five years or a high sensitivity test every year. Uh, I've never seen the outside ask anything about that, but it's possible because it is in the guidelines. However, as a colorectal surgeon, I'm recommending colonoscopy as long as you can tolerate it. Okay, when do we scope? Okay, or sorry, why do we scope? All right, so uh, colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in the entire world. Okay, so most common symptoms anemia, constipation, keyword constipation, it's actually changed in bowel patterns. So it's not always constipation. You may have a patient show up to your office and say, you know, I used to have, you know, thick, wide bowel movements. Now they're kind of stringy or, you know, it's, something's different and bleeding as well. The main genes that are involved, this is, these are the genes that are, are, are turning normal mucosa adenomas then to cancer. So it's APC, DCC, P53, and KRAS. P53 for sporadic colon cancer is the most common, and they will let, they love to ask that, okay? Your sigmoid colon is the most common site for primary colon cancer. That's the most common, okay? So I'm going to throw out a couple cases, okay, that are going to have 
need you guys to start thinking of what's going on. Okay, so we start off with a 55 year old female that's in the hospital after a fall showing a hemoglobin of seven. She's been noticing, you know, over the last four years, her hemoglobin has been slowly going down. Patient tells you she's noticed some blood mixed in her stool. What do you want to do next? All right. So if you get a patient like this, okay, your first thought is, well, what, what can I do? What can I do directly to look at what's going on? Because you is going on. So colonoscopy. Okay. So you do your full H and P, you make sure six months ago then your diagnosis has to broaden. You got to talk about family history of colon cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, and specifically what we like to ask is anybody with polyps in the family, okay? So your colonoscopy shows this, okay? Big, ugly, broad-based, takes up probably about two-thirds circumference or so about 50% circumference of the, of the lumen, but it's not a... Okay? So a, a good question that comes up is, what if the patient presents to you with a flexible sigmoidoscopy showing that from your GI doctor, okay? What else do you have to do? There you go, somebody said it. Okay. The reason being is you have to look for synchronous lesions, okay? So people will get this mixed up. They will say, oh, there's a synchronous lesion 30% of the time. Miles, guys. Use that word carefully. It's a synchronous polyp. So a synchronous polyp, usually about 30% of the time. A synchronous lesion that's a cancer, depending on what you read, is anywhere from 3 to 9%. No number, but you have to look out for it because, God forbid, you take this person for a sigmoidectomy and they have a sequel cancer as well. That changes your operation, and you're not doing the person. The... Okay, what next? All right, so you got... Oh, sorry. If my sorry, if my audio is still spotty, uh, it's the same. So it was fine. Uh, let me see if I turn it on and off. How about now, guys. All right, I'm gonna keep going. All right. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. Okay, so anything else you can do? Okay, so what? Hey, Joel, Joel, try turning off your camera. That sometimes improves the bandwidth. All right, there you go. Can you guys still see my screen? We can still see your screen, uh, but without your camera on, it actually improves the bandwidth. Go ahead. Okay, all right, so if I sound better. So somebody made a, made a mention. Um, that oh maybe jumping the gun a little early without the biopsy that that is you that's a true point but looking at it you very suspicious for a cancer and if you know at, at this time biopsies don't take a day to come back they take two to three days business days to come back once said that that maybe waiting for the biopsy but at the same time if you're looking at that you know to the trained eye that's a cancer until proven otherwise it's big bulky broad based there's going to be something hiding in there. Diagnosis. Okay, blood work. What blood work do you do? They probably already had a little bit of blood work, but if you're concerned for cancer, you got to throw in a CEA. Imaging. Like a preoperative imaging, CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Okay. All right. So, and also with your CA, CA is not always elevated in a cancer, but it's a good marker to treat into monitor recurrence. Okay, especially if they're going to go undergo chemo, it's a great. Decrease and also keep a track of it for recurrence. So the CT scans are important. Why? It's the metastasis. For spread, your lung is number two. Any additional imaging? 
Right. Yes, you're saying right. MRI of the pelvis. Very. Okay. So, can we operate on? So, uh, with Mohana, so uh, so MRI is is. Now you can get an endorectal ultrasound. Um, typically, there uh, so ultrasounds have the advantage when looking at T2 lesion, so a lower grade, lower stage cancer. But it's not very good at looking at a T3 or even higher grade. So if you're suspicious for lymph node involvement at all, an ultrasound can show you those. Uh, but an MRI is going to be give you more information. But it's not a bad thought. It is not a bad thought. All right. So. So how much do you take out? What vessels? Ostomy, no ostomy. Everybody's a little bit different and it's based on the patient and based on the location of the tumor. Okay. So, and you know, this especially I get this question a lot from the interns. All you know, for like a little three centimeter tumor, you know, hanging out at the bottom of the cecum. The proctoscope, I know you guys are talking about scope. I, I, I will, I'll get to the proctoscope in a sec. I'm just talking about colon cancer first. I'll get to. Okay, so. So that, so the big, the big reason why it's all based on. The colon by and, and, re, and relying on those small collaterals to supply the. Good margin and usually for colon cancer, we want a 5 centimeter margin proximal and distal. Okay. So your goals of resection are an end block resection, adequate margins, which we talked about, the associated mesocolon, and your regional lymphadenopathy. Okay. And what don't you need for colon, for colon cancer? What's the minimum? Well, good. Well, all right. Along with that, this is specifically for rectal tumors. You want to take wall dyers and denovirus fascia when you're taking a rectal cancer. What are those? Uh, all here is fascia is the posterior portion of the of the rectum. Once you get down uh, towards the, the near the levator ani, fascia is in between the anterior portion of the rectum and for a male prostate and seminal vesicle, for a female the the, the vagina. Okay, nice little map there, and you can just point a dot and circle a dot of of a cancer, and then you see what you have to take. So if you uh, a sigmoid colectomy, if you have a dot right here, that's going to be a sigmoid colectomy. If you have something up in the splenic flexure, it's going to be a left col uh, hemicolectomy. Okay? Same thing with the right colon. If you've got something in the cecum, it's going to be a right colon. All right. If you have something in the hepatic flexure, you get concerned about your margins. You go to an extended right uh, colectomy and so on. You see all the different types of things you see there. So final staging have to know it. Okay. So colorectal cancer is all about depth. That's you start there. That's going to be your T level. Okay. Submucosa. T2 is into the muscular propria. T3, the subserosa, and T4, you're through the muscle. Right colectomy, you're going to be taking the, the right branch of the mid colic and you're going to take the mid colic as well. Because you've got extended all the way to the transverse colon. So you're going to be relying on your marginal artery, your mid colic to supply the rest of the colon. Uh, so back to the back to the staging. So T4, you're going to be through the serosa into the parasitic cavity. Organs that are nearby. So that could be, you know, the abdominal wall, small bowel, bladder, vagina. Okay, you have to be very careful with these things. The nodes. N1 is 1 to 3, N2 is over 4 nodes, okay? That spread is very easy. If you have a spread somewhere, you're automatically M1. Staging. I'm going to make staging very, very easy. This is how I, I learned it, okay? If you have any nodes whatsoever, you are automatically stage 3. Automatic. Don't have to worry about anything else. You can be a T1, N1, don't matter. You are stage 3, okay? Uh, and same thing, if you have any spread, you are automatically stage four. Okay. Uh, one thing they love about tumors that are that are 2B, meaning a T4. T4s are high risk. Okay. They will talk about that these specific tumors may get chemotherapy in most places, but definitely you're going to get adjuvant chemotherapy for colon cancer. Okay. So how about lower down? 
Rotation is everything. You need to see where in the rectum this mass. That's where the rigid proctoscope comes into play. Because a flex, you know, you'll get a report from a GI doctor or anything like that. That's going to be, oh, it's you know, the 13 centimeters above the anal verge. That's with a flexible scope. If you guys ever have done scopes, that thing is very flexible. Okay, 13 centimeters doesn't mean anything. So you get a rigid proctoscope to try to find this thing, and that's what's going to tell you how to proceed with your surgery. Okay. If it's low enough, if you have a T1 lesion, you can remove this transanally. Especially, you can do a transanally in the operating room. You can use other things like TAMIS and TEMS to get the lower resection of it. Because that's what you need. Because essentially, you're going to be presented with a patient that has, you know, a small rectal, has some invasive adenocarcinoma, but unable to tell how far better margin. So you can treat this as a biopsy. And if you, you know, if you're able to, if you're able to get a good resection with good margin vascular uh, invasion whatsoever, you may have cured the patient. I can go over it pretty regularly. I actually have that. You'll see it in a sec. Okay. So less than four centimeters, at least if you can get it, well differentiated and no invasion. Now, in terms of the procedure, usually the upper limits of a trans, if you're doing straight four, is about three to four centimeters from the anal verge. But if you have a TEMS or a TAMIS, you can limit, you can go up to about eight to nine centimeters. There are some people that are very good with a TEMS, can have, have reported to go up to if an anal verge. That is tough, okay? But people have done it. Uh, anywhere from three to four centimeters, depending on what you read, some people say less than three, say less than four centimeters, okay? You also have, it has to be less than one third circumference. You cannot go after a, you know, two thirds circumference almost obstructing so it is limited in your approach, okay? Uh, literature that are saying that T2 is also possible to be resected this way, okay? But the pro but for the test, you're pushing for a resection, whether it be an LAR or an APR. Because the problem with the T2, that T2, okay, there you, someone has said it, your nodes, you have no way to study the nodes, okay? EUS is good to address the node status, Elizabeth, but I promise it's not 100%. So this is something to offer like the 88-year-old patient who has got a million, would tolerate a resection, but they can tolerate observation. So that's something to Okay, this is key. If you're, it never involves a sphincter. Made a good a good uh, post there. Hold on, I'm trying to see the chat because somebody had a good question there. I, I wh whoever had that question, I couldn't I couldn't see it on the chat. It went away really quick. Um, if you can uh, repost it, I'll answer it. If your tumor ever involves the sphincters, even if you're doing if you even pre-treatment, you need to do an APR because you have no way of telling even after chemotherapy and radiation. If the two is left over, so if it involves the sphincters from the start, it's you're you're, you're going to be pushed to an APR. Okay, so adjuvants of surgery. So I think somebody was saying for a T2 lesion, do you have to do any neoadjuvant treatment? Lesion in the col in the in the rec in the rectum, you do not. You can go straight straight to surgery because I'll tell you here and now I'll explain it. So for colon cancer, we said stage three and four, you're gonna get post-op chemo. You're not gonna get radiation, it's chemotherapy, okay? Stage two and three rectal cancer. So this is the T3 N0 lesion, okay? That's key because in rectal cancer, I mean, colon cancer, you think, okay, it's gonna be the node positive patients. In rectal cancer, N0 will get neoadjuvant, okay? So the, that you have to be very, very careful of. So at the stage, Three, all right. Usually, your chemotherapy preoperatively is going to be full Fox. Now, million, very not million, but there are a couple variations out there, uh, depending on the center you go to, and also a bunch of new uh, research protocols that are giving everything up front. So TNT, total neoadjuvant uh, treatment. Some of them are doing a small a small course of chemotherapy, reevaluating the surgery, and then finish the chemotherapy and radiation. Short course radiation, long course radiation, it's it's very variable. The absence not going to test you on that. But what you do have to do is they get neoadjuvant treatment. That is a must. Everybody gets neoadjuvant treatment for stage two and three rectal cancer. Okay, 
And a good common question I've had is what does radiation do? Radiate, so, so the chemo combined with the radiation, so it, it increases its, its potency. And why do we give it? Lower, it lowers local recurrence and it increases survival when combined with chemo, okay? Because radiation is, is the local recurrence. Chemo is the systemic re, uh, recurrence. So for radiation has side effects, vasculitis, strictures, ulcers, uh, bleeding, uh, and also well, it's not the chemotherapy that causes these people incontinence and issues, it's the, the radiation. So you gotta keep in mind that they love asking that question about, you know, patient with stage three rectal cancer is coming to your office with diarrhea and incontinence. What is the most likely to be this issue? And they're gonna list all the chemotherapy agents and, and one, one, uh, one uh, answer to it is gonna be radiation. It's radiation, okay? So why do we do this in the first place? You try to shrink the tumor. You try to downstage the tumor because it's all, remember for colon cancer, it's all about margins, right? For rectal cancer, you wanna try to get a good margin. Okay. That your distal margin, you wanna try to get at least two centimeters. There's a lot of research, it's acceptable, but you can try to get them to a low AR and a low colorectal or coloanal anastomosis versus an APR. Because somebody pointed out, APRs have a lot of, of morbidity. Okay, okay? it's a permanostomy. Their, their perianal area is closed. It's prone to a ton of infections. It's prone to a ton of issues. So APR, well, if you have to do them, you have to do them. But at LAR, your patient's going to be much happier because with, with something this low, they're going to get diverted with a diverting loop ileostomy. But if everything goes well, they can be reversed. Surgery, okay? When's the next scope? So you've done a, you know, right colectomy for a adenocarcinoma in the uh, in the ascending colon. When do you want to scope? Correct. Well, one year after resection. Yeah, one year anniversary. Very good. You the most not just looking at any other lesions that could pop up. You have to look at the anastomosis because if there's a local recurrence, where is it gonna recur? At the anastomosis. So you gotta look at the anastomosis very well, okay? So genetics, they love this on the app site. Love it, even though, anybody know genetically, well, like how, how uh, somebody made a good point, yeah, three months, as, so if you were not able to do a full colonoscopy pre-op, you do one three months after surgery. That is a good point as well. I've never seen that tested before, but that's a good point, okay? So genetics, they love talking about it, and it's a typical abside topic where it's something you don't see that often, and it's kind of on the rarer side that they love asking questions. Anybody know genetic disorders actually make up the population of, of colon cancers? Anybody take a guess? Okay. This one we love is FAP. Okay. So FAP, a couple of things to remember about it is it is autosomal dominant. They love, if you can remember the genetic disorders, one thing that I, I highly recommend you write, you remember is what is their genetic inheritance? They are asking questions where they will talk about this whole big slide and the simple it is what is the inheritance pattern? And you can knock them out really quick if you know, okay, this one's dominant, this one's recessive, because that's really what they're just gonna ask. They're not asking about anything else. They're just asking a question that's 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 you know that's made pretty into an appsite question. So autosomal dominant, the APC gene. Okay. I always remember the FAB or FAP5. That's on chromosome five. I've seen that before. Polyps present in puberty. Are dominant, but there are a couple that are recessive, and you and, and they're the rare ones. Okay. Uh, so the, this the typical colonoscopy is a carpet of polyps. These hundreds of polyps. Okay. These polyps will turn into cancer. They love asking that question. It's a very rare chance that you say 100% in medicine. Okay. So these patients need a proctocolectomy before they're 20. Ideally, what ideally towards the end of their teenage years. That way they're fully developed. Or close to being developed, okay? So pouch, J pouch versus ostomy, both are options and both are tailored per patient. Usually the younger patient you have, usually they tend to go for a J pouch, okay? In terms of J pouch, I haven't seen the ask too many questions about that, but they do like to ask the size of your pouch. How big do you want? 
much. Okay. And the typical answer is, is some literature will say 12 to 20 centimeters, but you, it, it's about 15 to 20 centimeters is the more concurrent answer. And somebody was already saying, what is the cause of death in these patients after surgery? It's duodenal cancers. Okay. So you have to screen them with EGDs. They must be screened. Okay. So it's very important to screen them with colonoscopies. They have to be screened with EGDs as well. Okay. All right, uh, FAP variants. There's a couple of variants of FAP. Uh, increased likelihood of intra-abdominal desmoid tumors and osteomas. Garden. Uh, Mana, so first, colonoscopy at, at FAP, depending on the literature, it's 10 to 12 years old. Some literature will say 10, some literature will say 12, but 10 to 12 years old is your answer. Okay, uh, you have a variant also associated with brain tumors. That's Tricot's. The way I remember these is Tricot sounds like a very Fancy smart name, so I think smart brain. So I, I just one way I remember it. All right. Next up is Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome is also autosomal dominant, found in five percent of the population. Okay. Oh sure, I like that one. Turban. So it's associated with DNA mismatch repair. The common ones are MS1, MS2, PMS2. There's a couple other ones as well. They don't get too complicated into that. Uh, the key thing is the family history. You got giving you the question. If there's a family history of endometrial cancer, very gastric cancers. The big one to tip off is endometrial as a common association with Lynch syndrome. So these people start surveillance at 20 to 25 years old every two to five years. Okay. Um, and the reason why you want to, if you have any suspicion of a patient like this, it changes your surgery. So you've got to send the genetics if you okay. If you guys want to look up the Bethesda and the Amsterdam criteria, I've never seen the the Apsite test that criteria for this. I've seen the test obviously for thyroid cancers, and, um, but if you want to look it up for Lynch syndrome, you can. It's very easy to look up. It's very it's it kind of makes sense. So away from cancer for a little bit, we go to the twisties is what I call them. So you have your sigmoid volvulus, okay? So most common volvulus in the in the tract is a sigmoid volvulus. All right. The typical patient, debilitated, psych patient, long history of constipation, laxatives, elderly, that's the typical patient, but don't let them throw a younger patient in to fool you, because I've, I've, I've done at least, even in my fellowship, that one was one guy was under the age of, of 50, and the other one was 55, both completely normal people with really no history of constipation at all. It just, it does happen, okay? So it strangles the sigmoid colon because it wraps around your IMA pedicle. So you are losing blood flow. So time is colon here. Okay. You can decompress these people with a colonoscopy and it reduces this 80% of the time. But be careful. If they're peritonitic, they're in a lot of pain, they look septic. Okay. You got to take them to the OR. Don't try to scope those people. Okay. So again, is that all you need to do? After you reduce them, okay, what's the chance of this coming back again if you do nothing? If you if you decompress them, you untwist them, what's the chance of it coming back? Correct. Yeah, Elizabeth got it right. 50%. So bowel, so reduce them, bowel prep them, sigmoid colectomy during the admission. Okay, that's the best approach. All right. And like I said, don't scope them if they're peritonitic. Okay. This is the classic coffee, the coffee bean shape. Uh, and the re and so some people get this and sequence confused. I'm gonna teach you guys a trick. If you notice, this is heading towards the the right upper quadrant. The reason being is the sigmoid colon's mesentery is tracking up towards the right the right upper quadrant. That's why the colon pulls that way because it's because it, the mesentery is tugging it that way. Same thing with the sequel volvulus. It goes towards the left upper quadrant because the, its mesentery is pointing that way. So that's a really easy, easy way to remember and why the x-rays look like that, okay? Next one, don't scope these patients. There is some literature that you could scope them, but it is not successful over 80% of the time. And it's all the way in the cecum. That is a long way to scope. And the, and the worst thing you can do for these people is install a bunch of air while you're trying to get to the point of, 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 of the make it worse. So, uh, so like I said, very, very low chance of succeeding and obviously has a very high recurrence rate. Uh, I didn't see that comment. I, I said something about the extent of the resection for cancer. I, I, didn't, I didn't see the whole question. Sorry about that. For patients, I've seen plenty of elderly that have this, but usually younger patients, they present as a small bowel obstruction. 
You treat them with a right colectomy. That is going to be what the answer is on your test. There are some papers that are doing a cecopexy uh, for an elderly, frail patient. Weird because you're taking them for an open surgery most of the time, and you're already there. You know, the, the big the big morbidity of the surgery is the incision. And if you guys, if none of you guys have done this, this is a fun surgery. Literally, you make an incision, and the, the cecum just flops out at you. All right, and this is the classic uh, picture. You see, it's that's why, because the mesentery pulls that way. All right, IBD. Shrink it in three slides, okay? But to teach you guys what, the, what to learn. So the key thing is learn the symptoms, and the way you learn the symptoms is you learn the symptoms of one, okay? Because then the other one doesn't act like that. You see bloody diarrhea, weight loss, abdominal pain, Bloody diarrhea, weight loss, think you see, okay? Mucosa and submucosal involvement. Continuous, usually anus sparing, okay? Doesn't mean it's not rectal, but it's usually anus sparing, okay? You gotta rule out infectious causes, okay? And correct, yeah, you're saying, you're, yeah. I, I was mentioning that before, uh, whoever put that for Lynch syndrome, you are gonna take out the entire colon if, if you find that they do have Lynch syndrome because the chance of recurring cancer in their lifetime is almost five times greater than the general public. So you have to extend their resection, okay? Yeah, that's also good to know. And some of you guys are jumping the gun, all right? So the medications for uh, uh, for UC, steroids, cancer, or treatment uh, medication, especially for flares. If they're in the hospital for a flare, that shows a bunch of steroids, you got to pick the IV version of the steroid. Don't just hit prednisone if they're there for a flare. I've done that before on practice tests all the time. And like, oh, prednisone, it's steroids. They're in for a flare. You go to IV steroids first, then you transition them to PO. That is a common question. Then you have you have mesalamine for maintenance. You also have now cyclosporin. There's a TiVo, Humira, there's more. They're not going to get too in detail about, about, about the medications. Uh, toxic megacolon and colitis. They have a high white they have abdominal pain. You'll see it. I'll show you an imaging very quickly. If they're not peritonitic, you can treat them conservatively. NG tube, IV fluids, steroids, and antibiotics. Half the time they recover, half the time they eventually need surgery. Here's a common CT scan finding. Big dilated colon, especially in the transverse and in toxic mega, mega colon, the transverse colon is the most common site of perforation. And everything else cecum that perforates, but this is the one difference, okay? This is the one oddball, okay, is that it's the transverse colon that perforates, okay? So screening for cancer, so Elizabeth, why? That's a good question. I'm not 100% the, the four patients I've, I've taken for this, it's always been the transverse colon. And the cecum, uh, but it's, for some it's not as dilated as the transverse colon, and I'm not 100% sure why. My guess is that the, the disease tracks from rectum to over. So I, so the transverse colon is always really diseased and friable. That's, I think that's my reason. Okay, so screening for cancer and dysplasia. Okay, very important. Okay, these people have an increased cancer risk. It goes up 1% after every year after 10 years of disease. Okay. You start scoping eight to 10 years after diagnosis, okay? Or after symptoms, they love to ask that question, all right? Uh, what is, so do you guys know how, how, to, how to screen a, a ulcerative colitis patient? Their, their colonoscopy is a little different. What do you do? What... So, right, it is a, you take a biopsy, so you get to, you get to the cecum, you get you get you get to your to your uh, appendicular orifice and you do uh, four quadrants every ten centimeters. Okay, yeah, the goal is thirty six to forty, depending on who you read. And some people even do it differently. Some people do will do four four biopsies per section of the colon. So everybody's a little bit different. But but for the book for the test, four quadrants every ten centimeters. Dysplasia. Okay, what do you find? High grade dysplasia. They need a total proctocolectomy, okay? With possible J pouch for UC, but do not pouch Crohn's patients. Don't do it. And sometimes it's hard because you will have these people that you guys have probably seen them. They have a pouch. They come in with, with pouchitis all the time because when 
years ago. Turns out it probably was crumbled the entire time. There is a there is a there is a watershed area that's indeterminate colitis. Okay, about 20% of patients are like that, where it's hard to really diagnose them. You know, a UC versus Crohn's. Okay, so what's the chance of cancer that if, if they have a high grade dysplastic uh, lesion? What's the chance of cancer that's in the colon hiding? Anywhere from 30 to 40 percent depends on where you read, but 30 to 40 percent. So that's why when you see these patients, you tell them the whole colon and rectum's got to come out is because it has such a high chance of high cancer. Okay, they love this question: extra colonic issues. Okay, basically what they love is which gets better after colectomy and which does not. So I always remember eyes, bones, and me, you can see, you can run, and you can bleed. That's how I remember it. They all get better. So your uveitis, your arthritis, your anemia, they get better. What doesn't get better is your primary sclerosing cholangitis, your ankylosing uh, spondylitis, they don't get better. Pyroderma gangrenosum, 50-50. And you can give them steroids to, to, to help try to cure it. Uh, the genetic thing that they love about IBD is HLA B27. It has a strong association with what's listed there, one of them being UC. This is easily worth two, two questions on the app side. They love asking you straight up. You're looking at a colonoscopy and they're going to ask you, is it Crohn's or is it UC? Uh, or, and they give you microscopic features about it and they ask you, UC, Crohn's. So remember, UC, cryptopsis, toxic megacolon, it's continuous, it doesn't have any skip lesions, extensive pseudopol. Okay, come think. The thing, so people love to ask cryptopsis. Crohn's can have cryptopsis as well. The key thing is the granulomas. What Crohn does, okay? And it's always transmural, it has skip lesions, and it can affect mouth to anus, okay? You, some, it's usually rectal sparing, but not always, okay? All right, so random tumors in the colon, okay? So carcinoids, okay? Carcinoids can be found in the rectum and in the colon, okay? The thing is, carcinoids are found late, so two thirds already have local and systemic spread. All right. If you have a rectal carcinoid over two centimeters, it's an APR. Less than two centimeters, you can widely excise it with negative margins. If it's even smaller, you can even do it endoscopically. All right. Uh, that's in the low rectum. High rectum under one centimeter polypectomy over is more aggressive. Uh, squamous cell cancer. They love asking this question, and they will love you guys the question of going surgery first. Surgery, no, not first, neither protocol. I'll get to that in a sec. Um, Whoever asked that question, okay. Is the key, okay? It's radiation with chemotherapy, 5-FU and mitomycin, okay? It cures 80% of the time. However, that's 20% that's not cured. So surgery is gonna be an APR for them. And that's usually for failure or recurrent disease, okay? So if you see them undergo, so let's not go, how long do you wait? That's a good question because they like to ask that. So they'll give you a question. Uh, they'll give you a question as, oh, you see the patient like three weeks after the dump this big, ugly ulcer, you're very concerned. You, you're seeing them too early. You want to wait at least six months after treatment to see eventually. Because what happens is that the radiation will and really nasty looking, and then it's slowly going to get better because the radiation is not done working. All right? Melanoma, melanoma. I don't know why they like asking melanoma. It's so rare. I, I've, I've, never, I've, I've seen one in, re, in residency. I've never, I've never seen one in fellowship yet. So it's the third most common site after skin and eyes. Very rare. Usually it's systemic when found. Um, you would think you would see a pigmented lesion. Actually, only one third of them are pigmented. So it can easily be mistaken for another lesion or mistaken, uh, or mistaken for an external thrombosis hemorrhoid. So be careful when you're examining these patients. APR if local, very poor prognosis. The treatment is getting better now that immunotherapy is starting to come around and, and helping them. Put that in rectal cancer as well with very good results. So these are the fun concepts. up. And sure, yeah, so central limb node biopsy is not indicated for rectal because if you do an APR, you're gonna get it in your in your section if you do it. Uh, but the thing of the problem is the rectal melanoma, it's going to be systemic already by the time you find it. So you're going to go into, you're going to go into to, uh, systemic therapy. So painful consults. Okay. So abdominal distension, no signs of obstruction, 
colonic dilation on imaging. Anybody can guess what this is? Yeah, ovaries. Okay, so pseudo obstruction. They are more from APR, but it's not specifically, it's not recommended just yet because there's still not enough literature in it just yet. All right, uh, so ogilvy, so pseudo obstruction of the colon. So these can perforate, so don't just blow them off. It, be very careful with the colon over 10 centimeters. And usually if it perforate, it's the cecum. Why the cecum is the weakest part of the colon. So follow the path. So follow the guideline, okay? This is why I always tell PF, or sorry, uh, so you want to do fluids, fix the electrolytes, potassium and magnesium. Really badly. Um, complicated so fix them check the drugs check what drugs are on morphine the narcotics you gotta take them off that ng tube you can decompress them with a scope and the key thing is when you're talking to these patients you got to get a good scope history on them because before going to neostigmine you should have a recent scope on them if they haven't been scoped you can try to decompress them with a scope as well because what's the issue if you give them neostigmine and they have a, a partial obstruction or possibly a near obstructing uh, cancer Okay, so that's one. What's the other danger of neostigmine? What's the most dangerous uh, side effect of neostigmine? Bradycardia. Get right. So that's why most people, most hospitals, if you're going to give neostigmine, they got to go to the ICU to be monitored. Another fun page: GI bleeds. Everyone loves GI bleeds, right? Stay stable out. All right. Quickly rule on upper GI. Most of these massive GI bleeds. 15 to 20 percent are upper GI. So how can you quickly, quickly rule out upper GI? Lavage, very good. One thing you want to remember when you're NG, NG tube lavage, you have to get bilious fluid back. If you just get, you know, stomach juices and your and your lavage, your 200 or 300 cc's of saline, you cannot say your your lavage was negative. You have to get bilious fluid. Okay. If you get obviously blood, you're not worried about lower GI bleed anymore. You're worried about upper GI bleed. Okay. So localize the bleed if you can. So CTAs, tags, red, red blood scan, bleeding scan, and scopes can help you out. Okay. If not responding to surgery, then surgery is indicated. Okay. This is why it's important to localize the bleed because if you can find it, you can resect that area. If you can't find it, they get a total colectomy. Don't don't guess. Oh, it's diverticular. It's going to be on the left side of the colon. I'll just do a left colectomy. And then they they still bleed. Okay. The imaging or scope. So this doesn't happen all the time, but per the book, okay, you scope first. Okay. But that doesn't happen in most hospitals because most hospitals, by the time you get a call for this patient, they've already been CT scanned. Okay. So just be careful with that question. Very commonly missed question because in, in the real world, that doesn't happen. These all everybody walk into the ED and you, and you cough, you get a CT. Okay. So diverticular is the most common. Okay. Usually, usually painless bleeding. Okay. 75% of the time it stops on their own. 80% is found in the colon, but right sided ticks bleed more. So that's a key thing to remember. Okay. Uh, up to 25% of these will recur and will re bleed. If they keep re bleeding, like, you know, let's say you have somebody that comes in. You know, to the to the uh, to the hospital, you know, four or five times a year because of this. Then resection, it, it, you could offer a resection to them. Yeah, they love asking about this, even though it's very rare. Uh, it's it very, it's much less severe because it's usually venous bleeding. It recurs a lot, eighty percent of the time, because it's hard to find. Uh, the most common spot though is the ascending colon. That is on the app site every year. Uh, so the so ischemic colitis. Remember the ischemic areas, your watershed areas. Which is the splenic flexure. You have pseudix point, which is between the superior and middle rectal artery. Causes a low flow state, obviously septic shock, anything that's going to cause vasodilation, these areas are at risk. The one they love to ask is the patient that just got a triple A and now has bloody bowel movements after surgery. What do you do? You scope them first. Okay. Scope them versus CTA, but usually these people are not are very sick. So you can scope them very quickly, flexing at the bedside. If the bowel appears black or gray, Black, you know it's dead. Gray is a bad sign of transmural ischemia. So they need a resection and an ostomy. If they're you know, still healthy, 
you can treat them with, with IV fluids, resuscitation, and antibiotics. They love diverticulitis, uh, usually again, left-sided, but can appear anywhere in the colon. Starts with pain and possible fever. Uh, you can treat with antibiotics. There's complicated versus uncomplicated. Complicated is anything having to do with an abscess, a, a minor perforation, possible vaginal is most common in women. Cold vesicular is most common in men, but, the, but our women can get cold vesicular as well. Uh, surgery is strongly recommended after a complicated attack. Uncomplicated, you know, it depends on the patient. If they're having an attack once every two months, you can do that, okay? So I said, why colonoscopy afterwards, right? Because if you have an attack like this, especially if you have possible abscess and a micro perforation, so you should want to get a colonoscopy afterwards to make sure there's nothing else going on. See if the, the colon is healthy, it's not a cancer. Especially if you have a possible concern for a fistula, you really want to make sure it's, it, it's not a cancer, okay? So if you offer a surgery to these people, what are your margins? Is it just the sigmoid colon? Proximal is healthy colon because they have pan diverticulosis where they have they have diverticuli all the way to the cecum. Doesn't mean you take out their whole colon. You take out what's not inflamed, what appears healthy. Okay. What about your distal margin? What's your distal margin? Sacral primary, so that's kind of the level, right? Rectum. You want to get the whole sigmoid colon. So when the tinea coli and wrap around, that's the marker of the beginning of the colon. Okay. That's very, very important because if you so if you do the surgery correctly, what's they may know what's the chance of recurrent diverticulitis after a good sigmoid colectomy? A little piece of, of, of sigmoid left. 25 to 30%. Okay. So the best exam to come to see it. CT scan, PO contrast. Okay. You're going to see air in the bladder. Make sure, obviously, that the bladder has not been interrogated with any type of instrumentation, a foley, a cystoscopy, anything like that. Okay. A lot of people will say cystoscopy. That's not the best answer because one thing is you're going to see poop, obviously, but you're not going to see where the fish is. And you may see like a little. Again, hard to clinically diagnose it, but the, big, the biggest thing is air in the bladder. So you treat the same way, you resect, right? So what do you do with the bladder? If it's, if it's for diverticulitis, what do you do with the bladder? Right, leave it alone. It, usually these are very small. The bladder is very forgiving. You leave the Foley in for a little bit longer than usual and you leave it alone. All right, so what about, does your surgery change if it's a cancer? So omental flap, you can do an omental flap. You can just throw a piece of momentum in between the rectum and uh, but you know, there, there's been no proof about that it does. So if your fistula is a cancer, you gotta resect with margin. Remember, on block resection. Okay. So you're taking a piece of the bladder with you. But what if the bladder is near the trigone, near the insertion of the ureters? You're doing a total cystectomy. That is huge, huge surgery. So you gotta be careful. Of the bladder this is attached to. If it's the dome, partial cystectomy, no problem. If it's near the trigone, total cystectomy. So classic picture there. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over anal stuff. Anal stuff is, if it's tested on the outside, it's very pretty. It's pretty straightforward. It's mainly it's going to be hem. That so hemorrhoid. Just remember, arterial is inferior rectal. Your venous drainage is internal hemorrhoid if it's internal. External hemorrhoid if it's external. Goes with the name. If you get a thrombus hemorrhoid, you can lance it or do an elliptical incision, ideally under 72 hours. If you're talking about elliptical is better because they heal better, okay? Uh, you can push it to about 96 hours, but anything after that, eventually they're going to get better on their own. Uh, internal causes bleeding and prolapse. External causes pain, right? The reason why is your internal, there are no pain fibers there. So that's why you have more options to treat. You can band them. Uh, you can, you know, infrared them as well, but don't ban an external. Please don't ban an external. All right. Uh, the grades of internal hemorrhoids. First is they slide below the dentate line on bowel movements. Second is they prolapse, but they reduce spontaneously. They prolapse. Third is prolapse. You can't reduce the prolapse no matter what. 
Rectal prolapse, okay, involves all the layers of the rectum for a full thickness prolapse. That is key. Usually six to seven centimeters, common in elderly women with straining and constipation. Best treatment is a rectal pepsi, obviously either laparoscopic or open. If they have a severe constipation, you could offer a sigmoidectomy or an LAR with it. There is a lot of new research saying that does not benefit the patient, but they may ask you that. Uh, if they're too old and can't tolerate up a big abdominal surgery, you're going to go for a perianal rectal sigmoidectomy and Altmeyer. It's a cool surgery. It is actually a pretty cool surgery. It's a problem. I recurrence, but that's why you offer it to these older people because, you know, eventually that's going to be good enough for them. So any different so so uh, for the lower end, traditionally, you do for a mucosal prolapse. So if you have a, if you have like a partial mucosal uh, prolapse, the lower is a good idea for it. Versus if you have a full prolapse, you want to do the resection. So that will be the Altmeyer. I have never actually seen a Delorum question. But that's a, but it's good to know. I don't mind I don't mind you know sharing knowledge or anything. So for uh, I I have seen questions about Pexi. So whoever asked that. So high yield anus, so fissures. Fissures, fissures are really ischemic ulcers because that, that's why it's a breakdown in the anal derm because midline, because that's the weak point. That's the weak point of the circulation. If it's lateral and recurrent, you got to think about Crohn's. They they love to ask that. So just be be careful when they throw you a, a typical fissure question. See where it is. You know, they're going to give you the location on purpose. Uh, a lot of them have sentinel tags. 80 to 90 percent heal with conservative therapy. Control the constipation, nitroglycerin, dephetapine, diltiazem cream. 0.2 percent is the key. The big side effect that limits use is the headaches, and that's very common with nitro. Dephetapine and diltiazem have that side effect a lot less. Um, if they're still having trouble, you can use Botox. If not, surgery is a lateral internal sphincterotomy. Just be careful with the with the female patient with a lot of childbirth history because they can have incontinence issues. So you want to try everything you can before you start cutting into their sphincter. Also HPV, you can treat your full duration. Abscesses and fistulas, what they really most can cause horseshoes. All right, and then good solves rule. Uh, they love this question. Straight line towards the anal canal. Posteriors will wrap kind of in a curve like fashion. Anterior one that's way out there to the side, that they love asking that question. So just be careful with that one. Uh, anyway, okay, and uh, you always start with the outer hole. If it doesn't contain any muscle, fistulotomy, best to muscle, uh, typically over one third of the external sphincter, get a seat on and you think about your lift or your mucosal flaps. I've never seen a question about lifts and flaps. That's more my level uh, question, but I have seen a question if it's too much muscle, what is your next step? And you would think CTON. All right. Questions by did run long. I'm sorry, it is a big topic. Uh, I'll send all these slides to Virginia and I'll send the questions out that I'll send the answers so, out highlighted. Because well, then I don't have the answers highlighted. Therapy that would be and all that right stuff. Answers, okay? Any last minute questions? Because I know you guys got to get started. To Awesome. Thank you so much, Joel. That was great. Um, and like he said, I'll be passing out the PowerPoint via the Google Docs. Um, yeah. Additionally, I got, I, got, I got at least like 20. And I have changed them from score to make them also much harder. So <laughs> nice. Um, but if anybody has any any questions about anything colorectal, uh, you know, you want to talk about a topic, if you're interested in colorectal surgery, uh, Virginia has my email. I'm sure she'll give it out at the end. I'm open to emails all the time. Um, I will respond back to you very quickly, and I'm always happy to help. All right. So good luck, guys. Okay. Thanks, Joel. Fan of old movies, you know, go out and crush that outside. Okay. Super.